Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome back to the Battle Buddy Podcast. I've got Tim Dickey with me here, and Tim is going to talk about a bunch of tech stuff. Uh, I was just joking with him a couple minutes ago. I'm like, you're the expert on it. I don't know that much about all this stuff, so we're all going to learn. Uh, it's about Agile and some other stuff. Great conversation coming up. Uh, we just had some great conversation. We won't go back into it, but uh, he just watched a great film that came out, Top Gun, and he he was giving you some amazing raving reviews on it. So all I'll say is you should definitely watch that because I know like that's getting penciled in my schedule next week. <laughs> so, Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, Keith, thanks for having me, man, and, uh, you know, pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So th- before we start, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you did in the Navy, how you got in the Navy, you know, whatever – Whatever you want to share about your story there. Yeah, the the Navy, it, it is funny, you know, I'm going to take and do the throwback to Top Gun. Um, at, at the point in time where I joined the Navy, Top Gun had been out for a few years, and it actually served as part of the inspiration for me to join. And as a result of that, I ended up serving in the submarine force on active duty for almost seven years. And if anybody is familiar with the submarine force, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but for those of us, uh, for, for somebody who is not familiar, um, basically to be on nuclear submarines, you've got to learn how the entire boat works to become qualified in submarine warfare. And so that really piqued my interest in this whole technology thing. And of course, having a rudimentary understanding of reactor operations and whatnot, it's like, man, I, I get this. Man, maybe I, I need to make a career out of it. And I ended up becoming a sonar operator and that's all computer driven. And so, you know, that led to leaving active duty, going into the reserve, subsequently returning to college and starting a career in information technology. And the first real job I had after graduating from college, working for Carnival Cruise Lines on board cruise ships. Now that would be interesting. I've been on one cruise. My wife and I went uh, last December we went on a Royal Caribbean. Amazing experience. We had wanted to yep. go on one for a long time. We should have been on one like 10 years before that. Like we can't <laughs> wait for the next one. And and, and think about the, the amount of technology that you came into contact with. I mean, from oh. the touch screens to all the interactive displays and what, I mean. Like everything in the casino is a touch screen. Like it's, it's, a, like it's, it's all touch screen, electronic locks on the doors. I mean, yep. you, we paid for the internet package. You know, so like we were streaming and doing video chats with our kids back home, like while we're gone, like I'm sure 10 years before that, it was a little hit or miss on that. But, you know, the technology is there. Like you're out in the middle of the Caribbean, nothing around you but water, and you still got very solid Internet. There you go. And I I entered the cruise industry at the point when all of this was really beginning to take off. And being a systems manager on a cruise ship, I mean, it's like, Kind of like being a kid in a candy store. I'm like, oh, yeah, because we, we even at the time we were really pushing um, some of the edges as to how we could use technology to improve the guest experience. So, you know, I, I look at it and I'm going, man, being in submarines wasn't such a bad idea because, oh, it created a career for me. Yeah, you never know what, uh, what what's around the corner. But uh, let's, I want to back up to the submarine because I'm very, very sure. curious because I've, I've interviewed one other submariner before, and I didn't ask him this question, but I, mm. I might have to shoot him a message and ask. So if you had to learn everything about the submarine, what would you say is like the worst job to do on a submarine? And what is like the best job, the best gig you can get? I would say the one that's most challenging would definitely be, be a culinary specialist, you know, because oh. – People, you know, people don't want their food. They want it flavorful. They want it hot. And unfortunately, by the time, say, you're into a six-month deployment and you're already 70 days in, your options are pretty slim by then. You know, and so it makes it it, it makes it difficult. It's not impossible. I mean, but you got to become more creative as to how you deliver those delicious and tasty meals. You know, and, and of course... That also lowers the bar and the expectation for the crew because it's like, look, we're not going to get fresh fruits and vegetables as we're crossing the Atlantic or crossing the Pacific. Just not going to happen. So, All right. So you know, enjoy it while you got it at first, and then it's gonna it's gonna be going. Man, I never thought about that. Yeah. That guy. That yeah. guy's gonna always have a, a bullseye on him. 
Yeah. As soon as the, <laughs> as soon as the, as soon as the good stuff's gone, you're like, really? That again? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and second to that is the supply officer. If you if you think about it, because the supply officer is responsible for for for, for all of the messes, in addition to all of the the repair parts and everything else that are going in in that whole that whole logistics chain. So yeah, I, I feel for supply officers. That makes sense. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought you know it's, that's, that'd be such an interesting world, you know, to yeah, yeah to and, be down there with just a small group of people. Just in the middle of nowhere, underwater, sometimes yeah. you know, and like that, that just it's just wild to me. Yeah, and so so for for the best jobs, um, combat systems, you know, whether that be your fire control guys or your your sonar operators, you know, it. I I enjoyed I thoroughly enjoyed my time as a sonar operator. I'm not gonna lie, you know, it it fed my inner geek. It helped me understand a lot about uh, acoustic intelligence and and how to analyze things, which we might get to that in the latter part when we talk about what I did on the back side of my career, supporting special operations. Two cool kind of career fields that yeah. don't necessarily go together, but yet I somehow made them work. Yeah. So as a sonar, uh, uh, we because we talked about this earlier, like with the Top Gun before we hit record, we we're talking about how as veterans, like we see movies and like we pick them apart. So do you? how accurate do those look in films or is it just complete garbage most of the time? I, I would say that, that on the back side of it, um, when, when we're talking about the classics of Hunt for Red October and Crimson Tide. Yeah. They, they, they really don't do the combat systems, you know, department, any, any, uh, any favors because a lot of the displays and the information it's like, yeah, no, maybe on surface ships, but not on, not on submarines. If they they want to make it look cool, but it, it's not, I mean, it's, yeah, they just grab some extra parts wherever and make it look cool and yeah. <laughs> make it do something on screen. And Oh yeah. The, 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 99% well, of people won't know the difference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the visualization of the incoming torpedo or the, you know, the, the, the other submarine or other submarines that are hunting. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's not that cool. You mean it's not like a really realistic little diagram of the it, ship coming in? It looks exactly it, like that model. <laughs> it's not a video. It is not Battleship. Seriously, Hollywood. Hollywood needs to do something to improve the realism on these. Yeah, they got some big budget. All right, it's time to start hiring some veterans to get that realism in your films. I'm just, okay. I'm just saying. I'm not saying I'm for hire, but I, yeah. I am for the right price. <laughs> I think I think most of us, if there's if there's a, a certain amount of money, we wouldn't mind putting a pause on our careers. To, to absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if there's, if there's enough zeros on that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Hollywood. If you're if you're calling for guys who might might help you get the authenticity right, we're probably not going to ignore your call. The money has to be right. On exactly, that. exactly, exactly. So. After we'll just go right in. After you got yeah. done with the submarine or stuff, you went into special forces. Tell us a little bit about about that. What you yeah, did there. Yeah, it, the uh, the special operations thing actually. There there was a bridge in, in my first submarine, the USS Archerfish, which is now of course officially decommissioned and hasn't been in operation for years. We had SEAL delivery vehicle team two attached to us, and so that was part of our mission set. So I, I got I got into it really early and I went, wow, this is a really cool community to be a part of. So fast forward a number of years and uh, during my time in the reserve, I did a little interim stint in the Coast Guard Reserve. All right, Coasties, I got to acknowledge you've got a really tough mission and I'm not going to lie. I, you know, being, being down in Miami with with uh, migrant operations and drug interdiction, it was it was really fast paced, even on the weekends. So um, I transitioned back into the Navy Reserve because I was at that point where I was like, well, I've only got a few years left until I can retire. You know, what might that look like? And, you know, doing that put me back into the special operations community totally and completely. And that was that was an eye opener being on the inside of it, being part of headquarters staff, uh, because I was uh, attached to Special Operations Command South down in Homestead, Florida. And uh, it was immersive. And in the meanwhile, I was actually changing jobs and becoming an intelligence guy in the process. And so I, 
I got to see it firsthand. I got to participate in, in multinational exercises. I was on command staff for a period of time supporting um, from from the jock. You know, I, I was I was like in it, <laughs> you know, as a reservist. But the, the the attitude and the thinking behind it was if you bring capability to to the team and we've got a gap, we are going to figure out a way to get you in the door and, and get you on staff and, and a part of it because we need smart people. We need people who are capable of, of working well in a team who are going to set their ego aside and going to look at it from the goal and the mission. Um, and it, what does it take to accomplish those things? And so I, I was really fortunate because that fed into my last two deployments in uniform. And I did two rotations in Afghanistan and the last one. And I, I, I look at it and I, the analogy I use is, you know, I was like Peyton Manning. I had my two Super Bowl trophies, my my Lombardi men's and under my belt. And I was like, all y'all peace out. I'm going home to retire. But, you know, I I, I worked and supported um, the Rangers and other special operations units while I was in Afghanistan. And I saw it firsthand, you know, what that community is capable of at that level. And I went, you know, this is there's a lot to be admired about the level of commitment, the, the level of professional excellence, um, teamwork. And I could just go on and on about the different things that I learned. And as a, as a guy who already had a background being a part of an elite community going into special operations, I knew, I knew that I could measure up. And I've been really thinking about, well, how do, how do those people who've never served in uniform measure up? What can we do as, as folks who are coming in uh, to business to bring that kind of culture, that kind of attitude, that kind of um, mental toughness to business, you know. And so this is this is what I'm, you know, attempting to cultivate uh, team by team, uh, knowing full well that I'm not going to be able to simulate any of the, those experiences, but to, to, to give people kind of a, a, you know, a firsthand view of being an outsider in that community and what it takes to belong what it takes to really make an impact and become a part of the brotherhood, the sisterhood of special operations. Awesome. So, uh, so now you're on the, you move from like a hardware side of it to the software, like agile. Can you explain what the, what the yeah. agile systems is? Oh you? yeah. Yeah. So, so agile is, is a philosophy that uh, was published back in February of 2001. So, yeah, twenty plus Long years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's been out there and longer than some of us want to admit. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, that much. yeah. And and one of the frameworks under that, which um, yeah, some of the audience may be familiar with, is Scrum. And that that actually was was introduced into the uh, the software development community back in 1995. So Agile became the umbrella philosophy for a lot of, of practices and frameworks and approaches to doing work in a team focused fashion with collaboration and cooperation and putting together um, groups of people who want to work together and who are willing to really share and, and, and be, be close and be tight with one another and exhibit at certain behaviors. And, you know, so I think a lot of people think, Ooh, agile, well, you know, it, it's this, it's that really it's, it's, it's a, a way of working. It's this, this whole, we, we prefer this over that, not that these other things don't have value. It's just that we prefer to do things this way because we're being human centric in the way that we work. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I see a lot of tie into the, to the military there, the, especially the collaboration. You know, I think sometimes in a business environment, you have one department and another department and they don't really want to talk like, the leadership there is just like, no, 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 no. This is my baby. This is my thing. I can't give up my secrets to this group over here. It's like, you know, you, you work for the same company or you're working towards the same goal. If you could just communicate and collaborate, you could do so much more together. Yes. You know, as, yes. as a team. That, that's, of course, the leaders of those are usually the, I guy, I did that. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that, we we could we could spend a, a whole other podcast episode on that one. <laughs> yeah, and we've we've all seen a, a lot of that, but it, yeah, definitely 
you know, which in the military culture, obviously it's, it's the team, it's the mission first yep. and you got to take care of your people. If you take care of your people and everybody's mission oriented and everybody collaborates and communicates, amazing stuff happens, which Hello. I think is frustrating. I think it's frustrating a lot of times for veterans when they get into business and they yep. get into those environments and you're like, I'm used to working with a really diverse group of people. We come together. We know what the mission is. It's very clearly defined. Everybody's jobs are clearly defined and we work towards the goal. And I, I know somebody, uh, I got a family member that's in a, uh, works for a, a very large corporation here in my, in my area. And he was telling me the other day, he goes, yeah, I think it was like last week, last weekend. Yeah, you know, on Monday I got um, I got a meeting at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11, 1, 3. I'm like, are you just having meetings to have meetings or meetings about meetings to plan more meetings? Like, what, what are you doing spending the whole day in meetings? Like, what does that accomplish? It's, there's no action to it. You know, and I was, I was just kind of sitting there dumbfounded like, what a waste of a day. Keith, you hit, <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. And that's actually where Scrum as a framework plays in. And I just, I was having a conversation with a, a number of my fellow Scrum masters about this just yesterday. Scrum is an efficient way of managing how you work because you, out of, out of we'll say 40 hours uh, in a given week, you've got on your planning week, the week where you're, you're looking at the work that you've done and you're planning the, the, the work for the next week or two, you have about eight hours worth of meetings, which means that you've got roughly, you know, we'll, I'll be a little generous, 20, probably 26 hours worth of actual work time. <gasps> what? 26 hours of potential productive work time. And notice I'm discounting time for, you know, sidebar conversations and opportunities to catch up lunch breaks. Yeah, absolutely. 26 hours because you're only in eight hours worth of meetings. <gasps> Wait, where, where's my other mic so that I can drop that? Uh, <laughs> I wish I had one sitting here. I'll drop it for you. Oh, but, yeah. man, but you get yeah. where you get where I'm going. I mean, and this is, and it goes right back to your point. I, I'm a recovering PM. I did project management and program management. And I was like, I, I'm, I'm tired of this. I don't want to be in meetings for the sake of meetings. You know, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, I think that sometimes there's uh, meetings. I've been in a lot of meetings where you get done after an hour and you sit back and you're like, all right, well, I took down some notes. But nobody was, nobody left here with something actionable that they're supposed to go do, which just blows my mind. Like, we, like what, what are, we, we should leave this with a plan. Like either this is what we talk about next time, or th and then this is what needs to be prepped for, or this is what just go do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, you know. so here, here's the, here's the kicker, right? And this is why I really enjoy scrum. Um, when, when it's practiced the right way, every day there's a 15 minute planning meeting. 15 minutes, you get your team, which is usually 10 people or fewer into, into the meeting. And you talk about what, well, what work was accomplished. And I'm, we're talking brief because you want to make it, make sure that you get to everybody on the team. What work was accomplished yesterday? What is the planned work for today? And are there any questions or concerns that might prevent you as a, as a team member or the broader team from accomplishing what you plan? And then you have those, those separate conversations outside of the broader context to, to work through that. And then if there's a concern that they can't resolve themselves, they bring it to me and I get to work on, you know, removing the blockers and the impediments and the things that I know are going to slow down work. That's my responsibility. It offloads it from the individual team members. And then I get back with them and say, hey, by the way, so-and-so with that system access thing, we got that ironed out. Try it now. Boom. You know. Uh, and, and it's efficient. And when it's done right, I've seen amazing things happen with teams. And that, and here's the thing. It doesn't even have to be software. It can be any sort of cross-functional team. You just bring the right skills to the table. You get an agreement. You spend your 15 minutes planning and you know what you're going to do for the day. Action. Wait, where is that microphone? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, having having an idea what what you need to do is is important. I just did. Uh, um, well, it's pre-recorded, but um, Nierka Castaneda, who was a previous guest on my show here, she hosted the Business and Art Infusion Summit. It was virtual this last week, and I did about a 15-minute speech that I sent to her about like time management. You know, one of my key points in there was you need to really, really plan your schedule. You need to – you can't just wing it every day. You know, I look at my schedule every weekend for what's, what is this week? What is the next week? What do I have that is set in stone that I have to be at? What other tasks do I need? And I start time blocking and I just start throwing it in my calendar. And you know what? Tomorrow, if I wake up and, you know, we got Memorial Day weekend this weekend. So if I wake up tomorrow and decide that whatever I'm doing on Tuesday is not time sensitive for that day and I want to move it to Friday, then so be it. I move it to Friday. I, you know, kind of always shift or something comes up. You know, I told you I had things come up this morning for work. That's fine. Just move something around. But, you know, as you're finally massaging that schedule, you know what, what your goals are every day. Yeah. You wake up. Yeah. Like I, I go to bed the night before. I look at my schedule, do some fine-tuned adjustments. Oh, you know, maybe I need an extra four. I know there's road. Yeah, I'm a realtor. So, uh, you know, I left half an hour to get from this appointment to that appointment. Maybe I need to shift that to 45 minutes because there's road construction here. Whatever. You know, just finally adjust yeah. that schedule. And then that night, I know exactly what time I need to wake up, what time I need to get ready, where I need to be and when, <laughs> what I have to prep for. And it's so amazing to just be that efficient. Yeah. And I, I, and other people just, I guess, just wake up and just, hmm, what the hell am I going to do But, you know, Keith, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're hitting, you're hitting all of the same things that, that we talk about in, in the agile product and service development space, because it's now beyond just, you know, software. And it is, it is, look, we have to be opportunistic and be able to pivot and adjust based on emergent things. Hey, you know what? You, you gave a great example. If, if you as a realtor have somebody calling you saying, hey, I'm ready to buy, are, are you going to be foolish enough? Well, hold on, hold on. Sorry. My, my plan today is I got to do this piece of paperwork and I got to get this contract completely through the broker and make sure that you know we're funded for no no you're going to be opt- opportunistic right hey thanks for letting me know let me move a few things around on my schedule it would be a pleasure to serve you yeah one of the things i do for my schedule because i use google um you know not an endorsement but it works good for me <laughs> there you go <laughs> I, I color coordinate it so that i know i can look at my calendar and be like this is this is all the video or like webinars and meetings are blue Um, appointments like listing appointments and and showings are bright red. Like those are set in stone. They are confirmed times. Those do not change. But if it's uh, just another task, it's or, or personal appointment or something, it's green. I I can shift those around all I want. And then I can look at my schedule. If somebody calls and says, yeah, I want to do tomorrow morning. I can't do tomorrow morning. I I have these meetings, but I can do early afternoon or I can fit you in here, 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 here. So you know, and everybody has such a different, different life, but I've been like that for a long time. And when I talk to other people and I'm like, how on earth do you wake up every day and think to yourself as you're laying in bed, what am I going to do today? Oh, uh, you know what? Maybe I, I'll, I'll just make the blanket excuse. The military did it to us. Okay. <laughs> that could, that could be it. <laughs> Proper planning, right? Yeah. Oh right. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's, yeah, military did a lot of things to us. <laughs> yeah, that's just, just add that to the list. There you go. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, and, and like I said, for me, it's just hard to imagine that. You know, for some people, it might work, just depends on your schedule. But, you know, to what you got going on in, you know, if you're running a business or you're, or you're in a corporate environment, that your time is needs to be efficient. Yeah. So just find a system that works for you and tweak it. I mean, yeah. I'm always tweaking mine. You know, I always learn something new. So, hey, you know what? It, it, I, so, so here's, here's what I'd like to, to challenge you to do is take a look at Scrum as a framework and see if that actually would work within your office. Because, you know, if, if there's an opportunity to make more efficient use of time, the, the prescribed way of applying Scrum is you, you structure it so that, Say if you guys are working on a monthly cadence where you have it have it an all hands, 
you know, every month, you can say, look, we're going to do four week sprints. And a sprint is just a, a time box to, to say, hey, this, this is the work that we're committed to doing you know, within the next month. And oh, by the way, when we're done, we're going to come together. We're going to look at what was done, see what was successfully accomplished as a team. And then we're going to roll into a meeting called a, a retrospective. So the, the first one's the review. The next one's the retrospective. Look at the team dynamics. What worked well for us as a team? You know, did uh, did did a number of realtors cover for one another and that was successful? You know, was there good lines of communication between the realtors and the and the brokers in the business? You know, the, any number of things that you can look at from from the team perspective and figure out what was working and what needs to be improved. And then, of course, you can roll right into your planning for your next month after that, which would be your sprint planning. And again, that's like eight hours worth of work to free up you know, in a case of, we'll say, we'll do the 26, 26. So that would be 52, 52 hours in a regular work week, 52 hours. Well, I'm sorry, two, no, that would be 104 for a month. I'm thinking 52 for two weeks, 104 for a month, 104 productive hours in a, in a normal eight hour workday. And I know realtors don't work normal eight hour workdays, <laughs> but I mean, Imagine the amount of efficiency that the entire office could achieve by just using Scrum as a framework to guide how meetings are handled. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, or um, yeah, yeah. That is, that is something you, you, you take a look at. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, there's really nothing special about being a Scrum master. You're just the person there to to help remove impediments and and. Help the help the team. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Which is the bulk of what I do anymore. I facilitate, <laughs> which is yeah. fine because I I love not being the smartest guy in the room. I really do, and and that's that's the beauty of Scrum. It puts me in a position where oftentimes I'm like looking around and I'm going, man, there are really I got I got really bright, smart, talented people around me, and so I don't feel alone. And I can take a step back and listen, and go, hey. Maybe maybe we've got an alternative perspective here from a quiet person. So and so, what do you think about that? And man, it's amazing the kind of ooh, it's like magic. Just saying, it's like magic, getting quiet people to talk who are normally introverted and who who are like, yeah, you know, don't like talking in groups. But we value what you bring to the table. Yeah, a lot of those quiet people that don't talk in groups, they sit back and listen. They soak mm -hmm. up everything. Um, you know, that was, that was me for, for a while, for a few years. I wouldn't, I didn't talk too much. Yeah. And over the last couple of years, I've, I feel like I've found my voice a little bit more in some of the committees and, and stuff that I'm on. And I'm like, I don't care anymore. If I piss somebody off, so be it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak the truth. <laughs> you know, I, if, if it needs to be said, it's going to be said. I'm going to say it in a professional way, yeah. but if it hurts somebody's feelings or somebody doesn't like it, so be it. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we need to respect each other's opinions, even if yeah, they're wrong. It, exactly. Wrong. Yeah. And that, and that's, you know, and I'll, I've, you know, this is, this is where I'll say that, that uh, the scrum values and the values that were taught in the military really, they, they match up very nicely, you know, and I, I look at it and I go, man, we figured out how to play well with each other in uniform across all the branches of service. Why can't we just do this in regular society? I mean, it ain't that hard. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've sat in different places on different different boards and committees over the years, and I see wild differences. You know, some of them are very loosely ran and not very controlled, and there's drama and, and stuff like that. And then other ones are professional, and everybody's right. respectful, and there's a mission. And I can't even begin to say how much more efficient the, the yeah. more professional environment is. So, from you know, my perspective, so. so, you know, and that, that begs a really good question. I'm not trying to flip the interview around. Do you think this is the difference between um, command and control and leader's intent where the leader, the leader, whoever, whoever they are, because their, their leadership is an emergent prop, you know, an emergent behavior that anybody can demonstrate at any time. The leader who steps up and says, look, these are what the guardrails are. This is what acceptable behavior looks like. All, all we expect is that members of this organization, members of this group, operate within these 
the policies, processes, procedures, these guidelines, these guardrails, and let's get stuff done. Let's get stuff taken care of. Yeah, I think right when up. those when those are there, uh, things work well. When they're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When it, when it, when it's, off the rails. Yeah, when, I'm going to use a big word. When it's completely laissez faire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but so so this whole scrum thing. I mean, just yep. just to kind of recap this, because um, I'm trying to frame it in my mind. Yeah. So you so you'd have a meeting. Let's just say so you could pick the 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 time that you want, like four weeks, eight yep. weeks, whatever. So you pick your well, time no, frame. Yeah, pick your pick your duration. Yeah, and then you have a meeting time. to discuss yep. what the plans and the goals and the guy the, the the guardrails and all that are. Yep. And then you put your team out there to work. Yep. And say you give them, you know, you know your job. Go do your job. If you have problems, come back to me, and we'll figure out the solution. Yep. And then and at you the end, your, you have you have a review of each person's job, and then you have a review of how the team worked efficiently. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then you go right so, into the next period. Well, and, and so so there's actually it's two different types of reviews. So and let's not forget the daily planning, that 15 minute, you of know, course, get, yeah. get everybody together to see how things are going, you know. Um, but there's 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 the external, which is, you know, in your case, it would be it would be kind of a client facing review where you would bring current and past clients into the office to say, Hey, look, we're, we're looking for opportunities to improve, you know, our product, our service to you. We've done a few things that we think might interest you. Would you mind coming in for a half an hour on a Friday to just give us some feedback? So then you're touching your customer. Hmm, you're, actually, you're actually saying, look, we're, we're going to be transparent with you. We don't know if we're doing well or we're doing poorly by you. What, what are those things that you would like for us to work on? You know, some things. Anybody who's in the service industry, not, not just real estate, but anybody who's in sales service industry, that's a, that's a pretty neat idea. Yeah. Um, you could just invite them out to coffee. You'd be like, hey, I'm, I'm buying the coffee. Yep. Meet me at this coffee shop. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to gain your business, but you're a valued past client or connection. And I would yep. love to get your take on some of these things that our business is doing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, then you, that feeds into your team internal focused, uh, you know, quality meeting where you're, you're looking at the la- last month, you know, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks worth of performance and going, hey, so based on the, these conversations with our customers, now we're going to look at our own team performance and we're going to figure out what it is for the next, you know, X number of weeks that we're going to do differently. And oh, by the way, you don't have to continue stuff that isn't getting the results that you want to do. So you, you time box that experiment. You just say, look for the next month, we're going to try this. If it doesn't work, we'll pivot and adjust. You know, if, if we just hated the results, we're, we're, Hey, you know what? Failed experiment. We learned something. This is not good for us. <laughs> it's know? just like somebody who has a physical store and they've got an item on their shelves that nobody buys. Are you going to order some more a year from now? No. If, it, if it's not making you any profit, you're not going to keep it on the shelves. You're going to put something else more valuable there. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's, 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 you know, in, in, in uh, Japanese lean thinking, that's muda, that's waste. It's, it's, it's an asset that's held hostage by an unreceptive market. So yeah, he, you know, the, the, this is the amazing thing, and I, I'm just saying this because I've been I've been on this journey of of learning about all of the things that make products and services great, all of those things that make them excellent, and and a desirable and and delightful experience. And I'm realizing, man, we're we're learning the things that were in place back in the 40s and 50s. And we're still not getting it right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad to be at this point where, where I can put a different, I, I can bring a different perspective because this was, you know, the military angle is, I think, the unique position that I'll say broadly the veterans community brings in. We, we are naturally inclined to give feedback when things suck. And you know, now whether or not leadership listens to us is, is an entirely different story, but it's like, you know, think about a, a weapon system that fails uh, during training. Do you want to take that into combat with you? The answer is no, no not only no, but not. hell no. no. <laughs> so, 
So this is this is one of those where it's like, look, we know what quality feedback looks like, and we know that we've got to provide it or else nothing is going to get fixed. But yet in business, oftentimes, um, you know, certain businesses have lost their their way. Maybe it's due to their position in the market, the the length of time they've been in business, um, poor types choices. of leaders. Yeah, yeah, poor choices, types of leaders that have been promoted or brought in externally. I mean, there's any number of you know points of cause that cause that 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 trigger this kind of domino effect. You know, and that that's why I I, I will refer back to Toyota as as a a, a, a an excellent business to emulate. Because where I'm at, I'm I'm in Dallas, Texas, and Toyota's North American headquarters is literally half an hour from my house. I I have intentionally gotten to know a number of people who work at Toyota because I wanted to understand what it takes. And the truth is, Toyota in a lot of ways is very similar to the best of what the U.S. military is about, selfless service. It's about making sure that the quality is there because – Quality is an intangible thing. It's the I know it when I see it kind of thing. And the irony is, is that customers are not going to pay for poor quality stuff if they can afford better quality stuff. They're certainly not going to pay for better quality stuff if they can afford the best quality stuff, whether that be a product or a service. And this is where Toyota really differentiates itself. It takes the customer feedback. I, I can tell you, I have filled out so many customer feedback surveys with the Toyotas I've owned, it's, it's incredible, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I say, you know, if, if this Japanese manufacturing company that used to be in the business of creating automated looms for weaving can figure out how to build cars from scratch, not having any background or experience in that business, and then continue to get better and better and better until it's the largest automobile manufacturing company in the world, Hmm. Maybe we should be learning from them. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to be learned from a lot of companies that have been around for a very, very long time that have found ways to be successful. And, you know, they go out through ups and downs, but mm -hmm. you know, it, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the auto manufacturers, I, I'm here in Peoria, Illinois, got Caterpillar, yep. you know, right here. I mean, they've been around for a very, very long time and they have figured out how to make, some amazingly massive earth moving equipment yeah. that's used literally all over the world. I mean, I know when I was deployed, we had, I, I, I was actually taking pictures because my stepdad worked for the company. I was taking pictures of the generators just so I could come back and show them and be like, look at this thing. Like I didn't know they exactly. made things this big. Yeah. I guess yeah. it was like a freaking a semi trailer generator. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm with you and you got to think about it. Okay. So those generators are operating in the toughest conditions in the world. And they're continuing to generate power for decades. Not being oh, yeah. replaced, minimal amount of maintenance. Ooh, good quality craftsmanship. And they, I guarantee you that, that Caterpillar is just like Toyota. And they're taking that feedback and improving that product generation after generation. Oh, yeah. And that's the reason why people come continue to come back and buy their stuff. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure both of them have some similarities. I know Caterpillar actually makes more of their money on remanufactured parts and and, and new parts for yeah. that equipment because you go to any uh, construction that you see out there and you'll see Caterpillar tractors or other other brands are kind of the same way too that are 30, 40, 50 years old. They're yeah. still out there moving earth. You know, they might they might be like 75 percent new parts since then, but they're yeah. just running. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. I'm sure Toyota's a very similar way. Just, yeah. you know. Well, well hold on, make, hold on. Make quality. Wait a minute. Parts do break over time. I'm, you do have to replace I'm them, just, but you probably have some good parts. I mean, I'm going to give the dirty little secret here. I know in Afghanistan, that's where Toyotas went to die. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in both, both in the figurative and the literal sense. I mean, there was a there was a third-party market in, in a lot of these less developed company countries where, you know, I saw – I, I couldn't admit it. it was amazing. I was seeing Toyota Tercels that should have been retired by American standards that were still being driven around on Afghan roads. I mean, it, it, and I, I'm, I'm just like, dang, 
it's not not the best endorsement for Toyota, but by golly, when you think about the fact that their their cars are operating in in Afghanistan after 30, 40 years. And some that's... places have minimal infrastructure and parts availability and it, it, things still running. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we digress. But so, so let me pivot back, which is, which is, you know, all of this that I do today is really, it's, it's around this creating the right quality of, of products and services that delight customers and unleashing that creative energy on teams so that they can go to the drawing board and get it right. Not, not perfect, but get it right. Get it out into the market, figure out whether it's going to work or not, come back, you know, to the drawing board. And it's this constant refinement, you know, we call it iterating, you know, it's looking for, for an opportunity to inspect and adapt, inspect and adapt. And, you know, it, it's, it, it really does work. And for anybody who says differently, you know, again, Toyota, do your homework. <laughs> I'm not I can't, I can't say anything more than that. Caterpillar. Yeah. There you go. I'm sure there's a lot of power too. in the fact that you're not having meetings all day, every day. Yep. And I, I think about those things. Like I've got days where I sit at my desk all day and I can dive into a project and I can put my attention into it. It's really hard to do on a day where uh, I got three hours, you know, you get an hour and a half into it and then you're like, all right, now I got to start, start prepping for my appointment or I got a meeting yeah. coming up and I, now I'm getting up and I'm leaving and I'm coming back. It just breaks up the day so much. So if you're just having that one 15 minute meeting, getting your, getting your mind right. And then, you know, if probably in the corporate environment, but you know, you go to your cubicle, go to your office space, whatever, and yeah. work. Yeah. Just or, or, right even, or even better if, if you're in your, in an open space, in a team space, you're working together and you're bouncing these ideas and these, these approaches and you're going out and I'll just say, you know, from the software space, you're, you're going out and you're doing some coding and then you're looking at it and seeing, seeing based on those code reviews, if the stuff's going to work. And so you're, you're figuring it out on the fly and you're not waiting to try and bring everything together. You're working together to, 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 to bring it together in the process of getting it to a point where it can be fully tested and, and integrated into a broader system. Or if you're doing it right, you're, you're creating a modular system where a lot of things are very discrete and they stand alone. And then they have a minimal amount of connection and dependency between those things. So that if one thing breaks, it doesn't bring the, the entire system down. It's not catastrophic, you know? And so this is, this is the brilliance of, of where, this type of planning and and uh, time management can really be a, a game changer for just about any type of business, you know. And I and I'm saying this because even even my company that I work for and we're we're an IT services consulting firm, we have daily scrums where we bring sales and biz ops and and recruiting and we bring them all together for 15 minutes. Now now the format is a bit different than what, what I would do with one of my teams in, in systems and software development, but we're looking at ourselves and we're going, Hey, you know what? If we're going to ask somebody to eat this dog food, we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to walk the walk and talk the talk because it's really important um, in collaborative work in in cooperative work to have the time to say, let's get focused. What are we doing today? and then get on with the business of the business. Yeah. And have the leaders to step up and say, I'm, I'm right here with you. Like sit said, eating the dog yep. food. <laughs> yeah. Interesting yeah. example there, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you gotta be willing to, to dive in and, and do things. And I think that's uh, probably a really key thing when it comes to the leadership aspect of it, but oh yeah, where, where can somebody, you know, anybody who's been listening to us for a little while here, where would they be able to go get more information on this? And if they, if they were at a company that they wanted to maybe they're the owner, Maybe they're a project manager and they want to look at implementing this. Where can they get more information on that? Okay, so I I, I will always volunteer myself as a first point of contact in this. Um, but I'll, I'll say the authoritative resources are um, scrum.org online, which is the home of the Scrum framework, as well as uh, the Agile Alliance, um, which is online as, as, as one of the other organizations that uh, curates this type of uh, – a way of working. And so the Agile Alliance has um, 
the Scrum Alliance as as one of the um, umbrellas underneath. It. You know, so the Agile Alliance is the broader philosophy, and I think it's agilealliance.org. And then um, Scrum Alliance uh, is embedded in that. And so those are my my two default uh, you know places to start from from an education standpoint. And you know, I will I will make the shameless pitch for for my company, Improving.com, um, as far as a, a good training partner, because we actually do a, a lot of training with Scrum.org um, as a partner, and we bring businesses in from across many different industries, and we get them started on these foundational things and and help them through hands-on learning to get the grasp of what it will feel like as they're moving their business to this way of working. Awesome. So for anybody who's watching it, I've got scrum.org rolling across the bottom, but I will, I'll put these links and stuff in the show notes for, for people on YouTube and, and who listen to it later. So um, you being in the IT space, I also wanted to ask because there's a lot of people coming out of the military to want to get into IT. So any advice that you've got for, for job seekers in the IT environment? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I will make the shameless pitch for AgileForPatriots.org. It's a it's an organization that I went through for for training and certification. Um, and this is this is after me already being in in the in the space for a number of years. And that's where my pivot from being a traditional project or program manager began. And the, it, it taught me everything that I needed to know to adapt a lot of what I was doing in the military. And go, oh, oh, I didn't know there was a practical term for this type of behavior. And it all falls under this 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 framework of Scrum. And start building those stories around, you know, what Scrum looks like, but in the military application. You know, and there's a lot of things that we just did intuitively that it's like, and I use intelligence product development as, as a, an example. I knew I had a two-week delivery cadence on my intelligence products. I was part of a multifunctional team. I was working with people who had expertise in different types of intelligence gathering. We're vetting this and we're getting it to a point where, you know, through conversations and, and you know, inspecting and adapting, it becomes a finished product that the boss can use to talk to the National Command Authority in a two-week time boxed manner. And, you know, so I, I looked at it and I went, oh, this is a great story. I've been doing this for years. You know, very, very simple for me to adapt that and say, hey, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a good position. I'm well suited to be a scrum master. And, you know, so the, the training is out there. Agile for Patriots uh, is, is one avenue of, of getting that. It's an outreach that's specifically geared for military spouses, transitioning veterans and, and veterans who have been out um, to give them access to this for free. Again, freemium. Hey, you know, we like free resources around here. Exactly. That's a good exactly. One. Yeah. And, and the, the folks that are involved there, Ravi, Janie, uh, Red, I mean, they're just great people. I love them. We just wrapped up the spring cohort yesterday. 10 people graduated from it. I, you know, I'm just like, I can't say enough good about Agile for Patriots. Oh, and by the way, my country, my company sponsors them. So we're a partner with Agile for Patriots. This is how much we believe in this as far as the, the military's, military community is concerned. So, you know, that's the avenue. And there, in, this, in this process, there is a lot of discussion about how do you, how do you make use of what you've got from your military background if you've transitioned or you're still in the reserve from your private sector experience and then get your foot in the door with the right types of stories so that you can you can transition into a role as a scrum master or a product owner um, and actually they're not roles they're accountabilities scrum guide is the the default 17 page very thin easy to read source of truth <laughs> scrum scrumguides.org another shameless plug where you can you can without hitting any other website you can actually figure out whether this type of stuff would be right for you pdf file 17 pages not hard to read i mean you'll figure it out soon enough once you read through it and you'll go "Ooh, i'm on board with that or yeah it's just not my cup of tea awesome Man, that's a lot of great resources like i said i'll have all of those in the show notes 
Um, I, I'm probably going to go look at those two because, you know, you <laughs> I, I, I just think it's interesting as I learn a little bit more about it. Um, just from a business perspective of just, you know, time management, reframing how you do things, being more efficient. You know, I think we should all be looking at that. Maybe even look at it if you just need more efficiency in your just life period. Like just, just to think about those kind of things, you know? Hey, I'm, I'm going to tell you a secret. I've actually had, had our daughters, you know, put, put stickies on the wall to describe how they're going to work on what they're going to work on for school. Kind of crazy. You know, <laughs> I mean, me being a scrum master, why would I ever think about using a scrum at home? Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I want to throw, uh, throw your website up there too. I'll have it in Thanks. the, uh, in the show notes too. So if anybody um, got questions, you know, reach out to Tim, go to his website there. You know, I, I do have all my guests as they come up. I do post a picture and a, a link to their LinkedIn on my website. So listeners, if you didn't know that, you can go to my website. You can find any one of my past guests on there. You can connect with them on, under that tab. Um, so, you know, definitely feel free to do that. So I, I appreciate you coming by, Tim, and talking to us about Agile and Scrum and all this time management stuff. And most importantly, dropping some resources because that's that's one of the goals of my show is is – you know, this episode may not be for everybody, but for those that it is, this gives them something actionable they can go do, you know. And I always say I want everything to be educational or inspirational to improve somebody's life. But this is definitely something that can improve your life. <laughs> you know? and, and hopefully, hopefully inspire you in the process. Yeah, absolutely. It can really have an impact on your life to get your time, your schedule and work more efficiently. Like that's. I would argue that that's probably one of the biggest things that you could do for all everything in your life is to just be more organized and on top of it. There so, you go, man. I, I appreciate you being here, Tim. And uh, take it easy. Hey, Keith, again, the pleasure is mine. And thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. There you go, folks. I uh, hope you enjoyed that episode. Remember, you can go check out our website at battlebuddypodcast.net. If you are struggling with anything right now, remember the National Suicide Hotline number is 800-273-8255, or you can text 838-255 as well.